Now we're going to be transitioning into Ignite Talks. This is going to be really fun. Those of you who are, who are not familiar with Ignites, what Ignites are are five-minute presentations with auto-advancing slides. So if you thought getting up in front of people and talking for an hour, if you thought that was difficult, well, uh, Ignites are a whole new level of challenge. So. Please join me in welcoming Adam, who's going to start off our first Ignite. Oh. Thank you, everybody. Hope everybody's starting to wake up from lunch. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce myself. My name's Adam Luck. I'm a senior engineer with Microsoft Incorporated. And what I'll be talking to you today is about ways that you can leverage DevOps to automate threat intelligence and detection. Um, I think it's critical that these are mechanisms that we can put into place without overthinking them and without requiring a whole lot of babysitting. And the main thing why I like to make sure that people begin to leverage these type of tools is your ability to set it and forget it, like the old infomercials. Once you have a mechanism in place, using a honeypot to automate detection of threats, you don't have to babysit it. You don't have to constantly look to see if the signatures are being updated or anything of that sort. And once it's deployed, you have the capability to let it work and do itself for you instead of you constantly looking through logs and being vigilant about these type of alerts. And the important thing and why I think it's necessary for everybody to do is what you can actually discover with this because it's important to note that our traditional methods of discovery are failing. And everything that's listed up here right now, whether it's insider threats or malware or zero day exploits, it's difficult to find. And I always give the analogy of using antivirus as giving a police officer a picture of everybody who's given, committed a crime and then asking him to stop crime using only that information. So it's important to have something in place that doesn't rely on signatures. And like I mentioned, our network perimeter is changing. You know, we need to really look at our workstations as being some, exposed to the internet because through methods of spear phishing, and ways that people going after an individual instead of after a system. It's so easy to get outside and in through the perimeter. So it's going to always be easier for an attacker to hack a human than it is to hack a machine. So it's important for us to treat those systems always as volatile and use anything we can to detect these issues as they happen. Um, you know, it's just important for us to keep in mind that very often, anytime you hear of these high profile breaches, the organizations don't know that somebody was inside their network for months at a time, and by using something such as a honeypot to detect these threats, it can give you actionable information much, much sooner. And I just want to briefly go over how you can design and place these systems. It's important to try to mimic your own infrastructure when you do this. Um, whether that's something as simple as putting services that your organization hosts, whether it's a lot of FTP systems or mail systems or applications that your organization uses. So that way an attacker doesn't actually know what it is they're viewing. And you may be wondering, how can I build my own honeypot solution to try to detect these threats? Um, you can use something as simple as a Python socket to monitor that type of traffic and see if anybody within your network is crawling around looking for FTP servers or crawling around looking for open mail relays on an SMTP server. There's a lot of open source tools out there that you can leverage as well. And there's also commercial products that you can build into a solution to automate alerting your analysts of these issues. Um, I also have a couple examples here of things that I've built using DevOps methodologies. Um, one of them being a DNS sinkhole. And you know, there's a lot of open source intelligence out there that I think every organization should try to be leveraging. Specifically, um, a lot of the malicious domains that are available. And if you create internal DNS records for all these malicious domains that we're aware of, you can forward all your DNS lookups to those malicious domains to a DNS honeypot server. And by doing so, your analysts are able to find out who is actually going to those malicious sites. I've also mocked up a retail point of sale system um, using a honeypot solution. And by doing so, anytime an attacker is crawling around inside your segmented point of sale network, you have the capability to identify that sooner rather than later. You don't have to leverage traditional methods, because if they're using a zero day exploit or just performing port scans, that may not be something that you can find easily. But by using this type of solution, it gives you that capability to identify it as it happens. Um, another scenario that it's happening a lot more and more is mergers and acquisitions. And this can create an you know, uncertain time for both parties. And it's important to note that 
you need mechanisms to detect this type of activity. And very often, unfortunately, MNAs create disgruntled employees. And I've actually had this scenario work for me successfully, where an employee of, at a corporation that my company acquired kicked off a port scan in the middle of the day of the systems that my company managed. I don't think he had any malicious intent, but that being said, it was good to identify that that was taking place. And finally, to have some sort of threat intelligence in place and look to see at your egress logs. Using that open source intelligence that I mentioned to you earlier, it's really critical that you do this type of analysis and it's something that can quickly be automated. And it looks like I'm wrapping up here. This was very interesting. Um, <laughs> if uh, anybody wants to contact me later, uh, I have my Twitter available. It's at Adam J. Luck and I can be emailed at uh, aluck at microsolve.com. Thank you very much. If you decided that you wanted to be slimmer, or maybe run a faster 5K, would you start on a new diet or a new training plan without first taking some measurements and then continuing to measure as you went along to gauge your progress? Probably not, right? But what should we measure? I like this quote by Steve Howard, he's from Ikea. You should measure things you care about. If you're not measuring, you don't care and you don't know. But why should we care about measuring and planning work for a shared DevOps group? Why don't we just do stuff that needs to be done? Or maybe just try to close tickets as fast as they are open so we don't fall too far behind? Well, I think we have a few problems with that. First of all, your stakeholders need some more information. When you're just doing stuff, there's a lack of visibility into what work is really going on. And even more, they have no idea how long it's going to take before you pick up their next request because there's no understanding of your group's capacity. Prioritizing across your business segments is also a problem. Your stakeholders are impatient. They are staring you down. They want their work right now. Whose work do you do and why? And you, are you operating on interrupt mode? Are you taking one emergency request after another, each one takes precedence? If so, you're probably task switching you're delaying work that's already in progress? Do you know how much of your work is a fire drill? And are you wasting time sorting out maybe some poorly thought out requests? Or maybe you pick up a request only to get immediately blocked because it really wasn't ready to be worked on, or maybe there were some unknown dependencies? Could you measure that wasted time? How about your defect rates? Do you know if your processes are injecting more defects than they should into your work, maybe because of those interruptions and the task switching. So how would you measure that? So what should we measure? Well, whatever you're going to measure, first make sure that it's going to be absolutely visible and understandable by both your DevOps staff and your stakeholders alike. People need to be able to see the data and they need to be able to trust it. At Fuse, this means that we moved our DevOps work into JIRA, where it's a lot more visible and it's more easily linked to the work by the application teams, too. We also like JIRA because it makes metrics really easy to capture. The first thing we look at, of course, is velocity, and we know that that helps us plan our capacity and understand our capacity for work. We're basing our velocity on point estimates. So before we start any work, before we schedule any work, uh, we give it an estimate. Okay, that's a big fat lie, because sometimes we get emergency requests and we get an estimate after the fact. We're now experimenting with using uh, complexity estimates for our points, so we're going to see how that works for us. Our group also does their work and plans it in one-week sprints, so we get very frequent uh, velocity measurements. And we're able to adjust the plan week to week when our capacity changes, like, for example, when half the staff is downtown at a DevOps conference. Then we, know we use that capacity to balance our work across our business segments. We want each prioritized stream of work to get an adequate and appropriate amount of attention. Now, appropriate doesn't mean equal, but what we're shooting for is a transparency in the process. Now that we can drill down with our capacity down to the segment level, our business stakeholders can take those numbers into the budget process. If they're not satisfied with the amount of capacity that they get for their segment, they have the numbers to back up their requests. Next up is cycle time. That's how long work takes to get completed once you've started. Are you getting interrupted? Are you getting blocked? Is the work small enough to move through? And then the counterpart to cycle time is lead time. That's how long it takes a new request to be ready to be picked up to be worked on. 
Is it fairly consistent for you? Or do you have some outliers that are languishing in the backlog while others just zoom right through? The last thing we look at as the, is the type of work we do. We're especially interested in the unplanned support work. You might want to hold back some of your capacity that you're planning for this unplanned work. And that can also tell you where you might have some technical debt or quality problems. So experiment with these metrics or your own. Track the trends over a period of time. Are they moving in the direction that you wanted? If not, adjust your hypothesis and try again. At Fuse, we're really lucky. These kind of experiments are not only tolerated, they are, we're missing a slide. Oh, darn it. They are, um, they are expected. We have a picture, it was supposed to be of Bruce, our sacred cow. He's our only sacred cow. Everything else we can change. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan. I speak a little quickly when I'm nervous, so I plan to deliver this talk in two and a half minutes. Uh, I came up with the concept for this talk because I just changed jobs, and when you do that, you have to get new hardware, and then you have to learn the tools that your team is using. And every time you change jobs, or on a smaller scale, change tasks or projects that you're working on, it's a context switch, and it wastes your time. We can't eliminate all the context switches, but what we can try to do is minimize the cost of them because we can't get rid of them entirely. Uh, developer time is expensive. So the, a technique that I've been experimenting with for this is containerizing all of my development tools. The, uh, every, everyone only needs to install a base set of tools, probably Git and Docker engine, and then you don't have to install anything else. So if you have, for example, an Angular app that you're building, you need Git, NPM, Gulp, just to get started. And you probably have those things, unless you were working on another project where you're using, using a different version. So instead, you, uh, I'm sorry, I have off-paced myself. I told you I talk fast. Uh, these, these are the tools you have to have for that project. But instead, you containerize all of your tools and run them locally as an alias. I, I called this alias for this talk, docker run here as me. And what you do is, when you launch the container, it's interactive, but it gets removed when it's gone because you don't care about any of the state. You run inside the container as yourself, and you mount the current directory and your home directory so that they're available to your tools. So instead of installing node, bower, gulp, you have a docker image with from Node, and you have Bower and Gulp in there. You build that image. Uh, the CI true is necessary for Bower because they made a change that asks you if you want to contribute statistics. Then when you invoke it, you just have to run it as you here. Uh, the dash P, you want to map your port in case you are hosting a service. Then. Instead of running npm install, you run your node npm install, and you end up with your Bower components and your node modules. And if you run gulp, you get served, and you've never installed node. The great thing about this is you can use the same tool set in CI, because every time you set up a CI server, you have to make sure you have the right version of all of your development tools installed, or you can just skip it and run the images. So now, I've rolled off my Angular project, and I'm working with Scala and SBT. I've containerized SBT. I tell it to run here. I use an image helpfully provided by HC Burger, and I tell it to SBT no share because I want to run everything in my current directory. Then if I switch to Rails, the Rails image is actually perfect for this. They've in, they intentionally built their image to support this work style, and it's documented on their Docker Hub page. It says you can run Rails, Rails commands straight from our Rails image. Then I'm working on a Java project, so I have Maven containerized, and because I've mapped my home directory, it gets my home.m2 settings, it gets my home repository, and I can run Java commands or Maven commands from that image. You can also bundle your settings or even some pre-built artifacts in there. But then I switch onto a different project that has Java 7, run a slightly different image, and I never had to worry about changing my Java home or accidentally building with the wrong tools, which catches you every time. 
Um, if that's all those th words that I said are too many things to type, you can put your commands in a make file, which I think make is one of my foundational tools, git, make, and docker engine. And then I just say make build, make serve. But I also told you you wouldn't have to install anything. So if you don't want to install make or if you really hate it, you can just make bash alias aliases for everything. And then your alias for Maven is existing in your, in a file checked in your git repo, and it's there for you. Uh, this was a, another cool thing that I found. In addition to development tools, you can have testing tools. The Selenium guys have containerized their uh, browsers and hub image, and it works fantastically for running your browser tests. Uh, when I was trying this, co to copy and paste these commands back and forth, the, power, the slides were helpfully inserting smart quotes, so I put the clean commands in a git repo so that everybody can try them out if they would like to. Thank you. I want to come back and circle back with you to get out of that stuff. So I hope that those slides will become available because that last one was really awesome. So I've got a bunch of questions to ask our operations team. And these are questions that every operations team needs to be able to answer. These are questions that don't have answers necessarily, that are everybody should do everyone this way. These are questions that you need to be able to answer for yourself. And if you don't know how to answer this question or you don't have a good answer for it, that's probably one of the things you should be working on. Because when we don't have abil the ability to manage our people, our places, and our things, then we're struggling, we end up dealing with emergencies, we end up dealing with ad hoc processes, and most importantly, we end up with things that only one person knows how to do, which sucks because that person leaves. So our people. Within every enterprise and every organization, the people are the most important thing, um, thing, and we need to be able to manage how those people interact with our systems as cleanly and as effectively as possible. So you hired someone, great, yay. How long is it gonna take before they can actually do anything? How long is it gonna take before they have a computer, before they have um, accounts everywhere they need to have accounts? And this has always been a problem for me. How long is it before I know I have an account? Because accounts get created, but nobody actually tells you that. Um, ops is even special, because there's special privileges that ops needs to have. So how quickly can somebody in ops do something? So now we, we've had this person and they suck. So we need to fire them. And how quickly can you do that? And are you certain that they can't accidentally, accidentally, um, do something that they were able to do before but now shouldn't be able to? But now, let's say we really do like this person and they do something silly like get married and have a kid. And they want to do something even sillier like go and spend time with that kid. Can we let them do that successfully and safely? It sounds really silly, but I mean, how many of you think you could take a month off from work and not have the place blow down? So places. Places are really important. Um, the most important place that we have as operations is production. So when we put something in production, what do we know about it? Uh, do we know that it was what was in QA? Do we know it was what they actually QA'd? And how do we know it got there? And more importantly, how does everyone else know it got there? Because that's really important. I like big red buttons. Who likes big red buttons? Um, I like giving other people big red buttons in order to push so that they can go do my job, like promoting stuff to, to production. Um, speaking of production, how do, can you rebuild production? Let's say that the data center broke down. Um, what, what now? How can we recover from that? It's really cool when we have a backup and we have Git. This is my biggest pet peeve. How people say, well, that's just internal production. That's just Jira. That's, that's not really production. No, it's really production because I can't work if it's busted. So things. I like some of those things. Two, one. the chaos monkey. Chaos monkey is my best friend. Uh, it's probably not any of your friends though, because who can turn off a server in production? 
yeah, go talk to those people, because they're probably lying. Uh, this is also really important. This is have, having to do with how do you get somebody up and running? How do you get anything up and running? Can you create a structural clone of your production on a laptop that functions without external network? If you can do that, you can do anything. And how do you know that it works? As developers, we write tests. Do we do that as operations? Server spec is your friend. Use server spec. Use Vagrant. And then every single question, you can say you do it. You can say that I have the answer to it. And my question to you is, how do you know? How does the new guy know? How does the management know? Because otherwise, if you don't know, it's just magic. Magic is doing something, and you have no idea how it worked. And magic in your operations is one big, fat timing. Fail. Thank you. <laughs>